The island's budget meeting for year ending June 2012 started yesterday morning without the leader of the country, Honorable Tokitalangi. A long debate on different views of members on whether heads of departments should be allowed to present individual budgets in the House of Assembly according to the legislation, as well as concerns raised with the chair of the Public Expenditure Committee who decided to present the budget summary in English rather than Niuayan. An agreement was reached for individual budget summaries for each department to be discussed by the House. The Premier's department was questioned over the employment numbers, including subsidies and welfare for corporate services. Acting Premier Honourable Kupa Mangatungia explained that the submission is for the employment of the bond store manager, which was previously advertised. The committee was asked for a report on the new financial system installed a year ago within the Treasury Department, but opposition was told to read the reports. The response was vague. Member for Tuapa, who is also in the PEC committee, explained that subsidies and welfare previously under the Premier's Department has now been reallocated under the Community Affairs Department. Continuing with the meeting, the Financial Secretary was asked to assist with a report from Treasury. Opposition raised concerns over the difficulties of the new budget report with some members of the House not fully understanding the new layout of the budget report and misunderstanding of some of the language used to explain what lays within. It seems the budget meeting will take more than a couple of days to discuss the report. Continuing this morning's Assembly meeting, the new Public Service Commission Office faced criticism over annual reports that has not been submitted for the last three years. Members of Parliament were puzzled with the leading employment body of government not setting a good example on the rest of government's departments saying they head the public sec service sector. A reason of why the annual report from the office was not able to submit was also not clear. Other discussion include public servants expecting to take leave with pay for one year to start a business. Concerns were also raised from the opposition regarding reasons for individuals to receive pay for a year in case some decide to return to the public sector once assistance ceased or end. Assisting Minister for the Department, Honourable Billy Talangi, said there is no expectation by the government for those who leave to return to the public sector. The new initiative is to develop the private sector with one public servant already on the scheme and six more are expected to follow suit this year. Another concern from the members of, over public servants who work at the airport on Fridays, Minister Billy Talangi advised the House that new Public Service Commission will continue to investigate arrangements between the public servants and their employment agreement. With continuing concerns regarding the NPSC, salary approval by the department for some public servants without heads of department, knowing does not give much confidence for those who lead government departments, says one member in the discussion. We'll bring you more on the Assembly meeting in our future news bulletin. New rapid tests for dengue fever has been received by the new Health Department. This latest acquisition has been gifted by the World Health Organization following a dengue fever scare a few weeks ago. There was some transmission locally with one confirmed case from New Zealand. Director of Health Anne McLean says previously tests were sent to New Zealand which took some time to receive confirmation. With the new tests available, tests can now be done on the island and results received faster. If we do have um, suspected cases, and that means that somebody has the symptoms of dengue fever, we can do the rapid test kit and we would get the result within 20 minutes of um, doing the rapid test kit. There is a small um, risk of having false negatives, um, and what World Health Organization advises is, is test the person again later, you know, in two or three days. Because as I said, the incubation time for the virus is 10 days. So if you test somebody in the first two days of the infection, you might get a false negative as they're developing the antibodies, which you then test um, later, so about three days after, you know, just to confirm it. 
But certainly we're very grateful that WHO shipped us urgently these test kits so we can do uh, the tests here locally. So what does the test actually involve? Well, it's just you, we have to take sort of blood from your arm, from, from the vein, and um, then we just um, centrifuge it and then we um, literally drop bits of blood onto this rapid test. And there's two tests that are involved in that, which is the IgG and the IgM. The IgG would test us to the fact that you've actually got antibodies, which means that you've had dengue fever before. Um, the IgM means that you've actually got the active virus. So IgG is um, the antibodies and IgM is a sign of the active virus. We would always send the blood to New Zealand for confirmation. And there's four different types of dengue, the hemorrhagic one being the most severe, um, but we would want to sort of work out the, the type that we are dealing with as well and actually have confirmation on our blood tests from New Zealand as well, just confirmation for the rapid test kits. So we would need to confirm that, yes. Director McLean says that there have been no further cases of dinghy since the two confirmed cases and that, unfortunately, there is no cure for dinghy besides dealing with the symptoms and keeping patients hydrated. The department continues with public awareness campaigns to avoid further cases of dinghy spread by mosquitoes. For the time that you get um, infected, it's a very small window of opportunity. You've got to have a female mosquito that bites somebody who's infected and then bites another person for transmission to occur. And the mosquito's only got two days to transmit it. So we do know that there was some transmission locally but we didn't know whether it was going to continue on. So it looks now, because that was several weeks ago, we've had no new cases. So it looks as though the one case active that we had left Nui on the plane. So it looks as though we're dengue, dengue free again. Having said that, we have set up precautions that we've got the rapid testing kits, which um, you, you've seen. And we've also ordered about $20,000 worth of um, chemicals to, uh, for mosquito control. And they should either be on this boat or the next. We do need to do more mosquito control anyway, and that should last us for about a year of active mosquito control. So we do need to be mindful. It is in a lot of most of the Pacific Island countries around us, and because we do have a lot of people travelling, it is possible in the future we could get another active case and have local transmission. And says that as we head into flu season, the hospital will monitor if people have prolonged fevers. A test will be done to rule out dengue fever. Further action taken so far, the department has placed an order for chemicals for the vector-controlled spraying. It is expected that the spraying program will assist in decreasing mosquito numbers that reduce the likelihood of further spread of mosquito-borne diseases such as dinghy. New Air Hospital has employed a chief medical officer after a long spell of unlucky breaks with previous appointments. The last appointed CMO from the Philippines had to return home without actually starting his role. Prior to Dr. June, CMO Dr. Alex Rekovich also faced family concerns forcing him to also cut his posting short. However, Niue has now received a Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Edgar Akawola. Dr. Akawola said he is very excited to return to Niue to help, especially as Chief Medical Officer, and he expects to address areas of concerns and focus on a healthy Niue. I would like to focus on clinical aspect. First is the NCDs, or the non-communicable diseases. Uh, I can see the figures of Niue is on the rise, and it is the same all over the Pacific Islands and around the world. Uh, figures for non-communicable diseases are on the rise, and that's one thing I would like to tackle first, mm -hmm. because that's the number one killing uh, mm -hmm. disease in Niue and also in the Pacific Islands. Mm -hmm. uh, cardiovascular disease, which is one of the NCDs, and that's one that uh, one of the first and foremost uh, uh, diagnosis or ailment that I would like to see that Niue will be freed or decrease in numbers uh, as I get to work here. Well, um, 
we talk about non-communicable diseases, and um, I think looking at some of our figures, you would have no, um, recognized as well the diabetes um, numbers has been really crazy here for Nui, especially the new ones that are living in New Zealand as well. Will you be looking at that as well? As a focus? Yes, definitely. Non-communicable disease will include uh, high blood pressure, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, obesity, all those areas I will have to look into uh, to make Niue a very healthy island and maybe the best around the world. I have read a lot of research around the world in the Pacific, in Asia, in Europe, in America, and, and most of those research on non-communicable disease, two things are, that are very common amongst those uh, causes or, or risk factors that, are, that give rise to non-communicable diseases. First one is lifestyle, second one is diet. So uh, diet, I mean, they have to eat healthy food, mostly uh, vegetables and natural food, stay away Minimize the, the eating of uh, meat and fatty foods, uh, processed foods and fast foods. Try to minimize those. Lifestyle, I mean, these days we ride around on cars, we never exercise. The people a long time ago, they walk a long distance and they exercise every day by walking. These days we get on the car, even going to church, which is about two blocks down the way, we still get on the car and drive down to church, which little people a long time ago, they walk. They walk back and forth, and that's a very good exercise. Lifestyle and diet are the two common uh, risk factors that I have seen in all the research around the world, which I would like to stress to the newer people here. Please, eat right, drink right, and exercise. Another area that Dr. Akawola specialized in is clinic, and he said he will assist in the surgical area was here. Clinical aspect, I've been uh, a doctor for over 30 years, and I'm, I think I am capable enough of giving um, advice and, and skills on those. I have no problem with that, and I'm sure we will minimize the uh, number of patients being transferred overseas, and that will save a little bit of money for the uh, new government. Now you um you uh, just uh, came from Tonga, but um, you spent a lot of or many of your years working in Australia or New Zealand. I think um, uh, that's vague memory that I had from speaking to you a few years back. That's correct. I've I've had a spin in in Australia, in Melbourne mainly, and, and in Otago in the Dunedin, in South Island of New Zealand, and also in Auckland. And um, I've been working in Tonga for many years, but. Um, I have spent a lot of years in overseas apart from working in Tonga. Mm. Dr. Akawala is from Tonga and has been on the island twice before as a locum. Talks about Chinese in mis interest on the island and alleged proposal to bring in Chinese families to Niue was not denied by the representative for the new government in this morning's questioning of the Niue Public Service Commission vote item for the budget for 2011 to 2012. Assistant Minister Honourable Billy Talangi said he could not report on the development of the Chinese yet as it is still in discussions and those have not completed for him to submit to the House of Assembly. Questions continue as Niue increases its relationship with Chinese investors who recently arrived on the island with one of the biggest investors, the Reef Group. The other is the hotel proposition by the Chinese which new government accepted and predicted to begin development in the near future. We'll bring you more on the story in our future news bulletin. And to end our news bulletin, New Year's sports representative numbers for the South Pacific Games is now official and standing at 58, including officials both from local-based sports codes and those based overseas. Team numbers from the Rock count at 24 athletes and 12 officials as of this week. 11 from shooting, 6 from golf, 4 from, for beach volleyball, 2 table tennis, 2 from weightlifting, 2 for athletics and 4 for rugby and 5 VIP including the Minister for Sports. The team that is scheduled to depart, depart siding on the 19th of August has partially been funded by government unlike previous years we got new government fully fund the sports teams. Most of the sports teams has fundraised to contribute to the majority of the costs which is just over 2,000 
per athlete for some codes. $750 of that amount has been funded by government just for the local based athletes excluding rugby representatives. Newest sporting body encouraged teams on Sunday to return home with a medal and acknowledge all representatives carrying Newest flag. The first sports delegation will depart Newest on the 19th of August with the rest departing on the 26th of August. We wish the team all the best for the games. And that's our news bulletin for this evening. Good night.